Amen. So the title of my sermon tonight is Replacement Theology. Replacement Theology. This is a word that's been thrown around a lot lately. Uh, the independent Baptists that attack me and criticize me. This is the thing that they love to bring up and, and throw out there. And, and they make it sound like it's actually really scary. You know, Pastor Anderson teaches replacement theology and it's so vile and wicked and evil of a doctrine. It's so horrible. I mean, they, they describe it in these really scary ways. So I want to basically explain to you what this is and why it is 100% biblical. And if you actually pay attention tonight and follow along in your Bible and listen to what I'm saying, I don't see how anyone could possibly walk away tonight not believing that replacement theology is biblical. And this is why these guys are so scared of this doctrine because it's so clear in Scripture that once you understand it, once you know it's the truth, you're seeing it on every page, and it's impossible to unsee it. Now, there are a lot of good men who are wrong on this because the brainwashing is so strong, and it's been pushed so hard throughout the 20th century that the Jews are God's chosen people, and this dispensational theology has been so ingrained that it doesn't mean that they're a bad person if they're wrong on this, okay? Because it's just a difficult thing for people to get over. But I will say this, though. You know, once you see it in Scripture, once you're exposed to it, it's so obvious that this doctrine will spread like wildfire, and it is spreading like wildfire, and that's why these guys are scared to death of this kind of preaching. And I hope, you know, if, if you're one who's mixed up on this, I hope that you will uh, pay attention tonight and be open-minded and follow along in your Bible. And Brother Scott, with the sound, would you mind just turning down my volume just a little bit because I feel like it's a little bit too loud in here. All right, there we go. Does that sound good? Are we good? It gives me the liberty to scream and yell without worrying about hurting anyone's eardrums. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, so just starting out as we talk about this, you know, what does this term mean to people when they say replacement theology? Well, I just Googled replacement theology. You know, the first thing that comes up is a Wikipedia article. And it says this, supersessionism, also called replacement theology, is a Christian, doc is a Christian theology, Christian doctrine, which asserts that the new covenant through Jesus Christ supersedes the old covenant, which was made exclusively with the Jewish people. Amen. The new covenant supersedes the old covenant, which was made exclusively with the Jewish people. Now, what does it mean to supersede something? Okay, well, those of you that are in construction, you know that there will be an electrical code, for example. The NEC, and there's a certain year's NEC that's in force. Let's say it's, you know, 1992 or something. And then, you know, 1995 comes out, and 1995 supersedes 1992. And what that means is that if there's a contradiction between the two, you go with the one that's in force now, not the one that was in force back then, but the newer code replaces the old code. So basically, you don't say, well, we're doing both. We're going to do both the 1995 and the 1992 and the 1987 and the 75. No, no, no. The new one supersedes the old one. The new one replaces the old one. Does everybody understand that? So the New Testament supersedes the Old Testament, meaning that there are changes in the New Testament that are different from the Old Testament, and where the two do not agree, we go with the New Covenant. We go with the New Testament because that's the one that's in force right now. Let me keep reading here uh, this Wikipedia article. In Christianity, supersessionism is a theological view on the current status of the church in relation to the Jewish people in Judaism. It holds the view that the Christian church has succeeded the Israelites as the definitive people of God. Amen. Or it holds the view that the new covenant has replaced or superseded the Mosaic covenant. From a supersessionist point of view, just by continuing to exist outside the church, the Jews dissent. You know, just their existence as Jews 
is basically an affront to the New Covenant, the New Testament, Christianity. I mean, aren't these things kind of obvious? Like, just by existing, Hindus are denying Christianity. Just by existing, Muslims are denying Christianity. Well, just by saying, we're Jews, we believe in Judaism, we're not Christian, we're Jewish. Can you imagine that that's actually dissenting? Oh, wow, what a shock. I mean, what, how, what else could you possibly believe than that someone who persists in rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ and following a Christless religion called Judaism, that they're rebelling against Jesus Christ by not receiving him as their savior. I mean, shouldn't this be obvious? I can't, it's hard to believe that anyone doesn't believe what's being described here. This view directly contrasts with dual covenant theology, which holds that the Mosaic covenant remains valid for the Jews. So basically, the Jews have their own program going on, according to this other doctrine, that would say, well, the new covenant, that's for us as Christians. But, you know, the Jews, that, they still have the Mosaic covenant. They can still be on that 1992, you know, electric code, even though everybody else is on the 1995 code. Folks, that makes absolutely no sense, and frankly, it isn't biblical, and I'm going to prove it to you wrong from the Bible right now, okay? Now, if you would, turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, this, proving replacement theology from the Bible is like taking candy from a baby. It's the easiest thing in the world to prove these things. While you're turning to Ephesians chapter 2, and remember, what is replacement theology in a nutshell? It is the fact that the New Testament replaces or supersedes the old covenant that was made with Israel exclusively, the new covenants made with all believers in Christ, worldwide, red, yellow, black, and white, and it supersedes that covenant that was made with Israel in the Old Testament. And replacement theology says that the, that the Christians have replaced the Jews as being the definitive people of God. We have replaced the Israelites in the New Testament. While you're turning to Ephesians 2, let me read you some verses that actually mention the term New Testament. Okay, listen to these verses. Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Mark 14, 24. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Luke 22, 20. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Now, does anybody here think that there's some other program going on outside of the New Testament in Christ's blood? New, I mean, Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross for us and said, this is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. But, you know, there's this other program, this other testament, this other covenant. You know, the Jews, they can have, be on some other program. That's garbage, my friend. There is one program, there is one covenant, and it is in the blood of Jesus Christ. Because look, every testament has to be certified with blood, right? Even the first covenant, the Bible says that the first covenant was not dedicated without blood. For when Moses had sprinkled both the book and all the people with the blood, he sprinkled the people, he sprinkled the blood, and he said, this is the blood of the covenant which God hath enjoined unto you. It's animal blood. Now let me ask you something. Is anybody today sanctified or part of any kind of a covenant or the people of God through animal blood today in 2021, that, that covenant that was made in the blood of bulls and of goats? Does anybody think that a covenant made with the blood of bulls and of goats is in force today in 2021? Or do you believe that it has been replaced by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb once slain for all, the New Testament in Christ's blood, not the Old Testament in the blood of bulls and of goats? It's over! Now, these so-called Jews could kill as many bulls and goats and sheep as they wanted, and they would still not be the people of God. How much less are they the people of God when they don't even sacrifice any animals? 
They're not even following the Old Covenant. They're not even following the Mosaic Covenant. They're not even following the Mosaic Law. They have no blood. Without the shedding of blood, no remission. They are not even following the Old Covenant. But even if they were, even if they followed Genesis through Deuteronomy to the letter, and they killed bull after goat after heifer, they would still not be the people of God because it is not possible for the blood of bulls and of goats to take away sins. And those things were a figure for the time then present. Those things are done away in Christ. They're done. That's why when Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the, in the temple ripped in half. Because it's over. It's done. That's why God sent in his armies in A.D. 70 to destroy the city of Jerusalem. Because they're done. Because it's over. It's the New Testament. The Bible says the law and the prophets were until John. Now it's the kingdom of God and every man presseth into it. Except if you're Jewish, the people he was actually talking to. No, everybody. The New Testament's for everybody. The New Covenant's for everybody. It's not like, oh, oh you're Gentile? Well, you're on the New Covenant. Oh, you're Jewish? Well, let me give you a choice of covenants. You know, it, like, like, like you're choosing on the airplane between the kosher meal and the normal meal. No, my friend, you're getting served up one meal. It's peanuts and water only. <laughs> Welcome to the world of post-COVID. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, let's get to the scripture here. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. With that in mind, what I just said to you about the New Testament in Christ's blood. We saw that, right? Now look down at your Bible in Ephesians 2. And how can anyone read Ephesians 2 and not grasp this is beyond me. Look at Ephesians 2 verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles. Now, let me ask you this. Who is the audience here? Who's he writing to? Ephesus, right? Now, where is Ephesus? Does anybody know? Somebody yell out if you know where Ephesus is. Does anybody know? Nope. Exactly. It's in modern-day Turkey. You know, we know it as one of the seven churches which are in Asia. And of course, at the time that this was written, that portion of modern-day Turkey was a Greek-speaking part of the Greek-speaking world. It was culturally, ethnically, and linguistically Greek. Uh, the Turks would come much later and, and take over that area. But the point is... He's not writing to Jews. He's not writing to Hebrews. He's not writing to the Israelites. He's writing to the Ephesians, which is why he says to these Gentiles, the Ephesians, he says, you in time past, you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. Now, stop for a second. If they were in time past Gentiles, are they Gentiles right now? He say, well, you were Gentiles in time past who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So don't miss this. Slow down, friend. Verse 12 says that in time past you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Does everybody see that? Back then, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. What's an alien? An alien is a foreigner. An alien is the opposite of a citizen, right? So we have people in the United States that we would call American citizens, and then we would have other people that are not citizens that we would say they are resident aliens, or they are foreigners, or they are just sojourning here. They're on some kind of a visa, but they're aliens, okay? He says, that was you. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. But look at verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You used to be aliens of the commonwealth of Israel, but now you've been brought nigh by the blood of Christ. What is the significance of the blood of Christ that we just read about in those three scriptures I quoted, the New Testament. This is the New Testament in my blood, right? So let's keep reading. For he is our peace, who hath made both one. Both Jews and Gentiles, he has made one, 
and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both, both what? Both Jews and Gentiles, in unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. Now, stop for a second. Who are the ones who are far off? The Gentiles. Who are the ones that are nigh? The Jews. Because he said, you used to be afar off, now you've been brought nigh. You used to be an alien to the commonwealth of Israel, now you've been brought nigh. The ones that are nigh are the Jews. The ones that were far off are the Gentiles. He said, I preached to both. I've broken down the middle wall of partition and brought them together. For through him, verse 18, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone. Now, here's how people will try to explain away this crystal clear passage. I mean, wasn't that pretty clear? Super clear. But people will try to explain this away. Here are the type of things that they'll say to explain it away. Well, this is just about salvation. This is just about salvation. It has nothing to do with who the chosen people are or or, you know, the blessings upon the nation, you know. And, and there's two seeds. You know, there's a physical Israel and a spiritual Israel. And, you know, you're, yeah, okay, you're spiritual Israel, but you're not physical Israel, you know, because there's two different programs going on here. That's the kind of thing that they'll say to try to twist such a clear scripture that's just basically saying, hey, you used to be a foreigner of Israel, now you're a citizen. Now, let me just show you some problems with that line of thinking. Number one, there's not a distinction made here between, oh, well, you know, yeah, you know, we're the spiritual Israel, but they're still the physical Israel. So God broke down one wall of partition, but there's still this other wall of partition when it comes to, you know, who's physically Israel. Now, let me ask you this. Why does anyone want to be physically Israel? I thought the flesh profited nothing. You know, last time I checked, it's a, you know, the flesh doesn't matter. Why would we glory in another man's flesh? That makes no sense. That's not a biblical concept. But look what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles, you know, spiritually, you were spiritually Gentiles, and now you're spiritually Israel. But, you know, then there's Israel, Israel after the flesh. I mean, that's, that, you know. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? The Bible says, in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, in time past. Does that sound like God looks down at us and says, well, maybe spiritually Israel, but you're still a flesh Gentile, buddy. Is that what it sounds like? Or does it sound like God's looking down at me and seeing me as a full-fledged citizen of Israel and of the people of God and that I am not far off in any way shape or form I'm not a Gentile in any shape or form I'm not some second class halfway citizen who's kind of got my green card but I'm waiting on my temporary work permit no my friend I am a fellow citizen with the people of God because I have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and the New Testament through the blood of Jesus Christ gets me full citizenship so don't sit there and tell me, well, there's these two programs. Is that what the Bible says? Because the Bible clearly says, well, in time past, you were Gentiles in the flesh, but now none of that matters because now you're a citizen. You've been brought nigh by the blood of Christ. He's made us one people. Whether we be Jew or Gentile, we're one in Christ Jesus. We are citizens. You know, if I said to these old IFB types that, that get mad about replacement theology, if I told them I'm a citizen of the nation of Israel, they go, oh, how dare you? But is, is it even possible to read Ephesians 2 and come to any other conclusion? What other possible interpretation is there of this passage than that I am a citizen of Israel? It flat out says, you used to be not a citizen of Israel, now you are a citizen of Israel. 
I mean, you either believe what it says or you don't. It's crystal clear. It couldn't be any simpler. So the next result on Google, after that Wikipedia article, was gotquestions.org. And this was uh, gotquestions.org. What is replacement theology? And this was an article that was very hostile toward replacement theology, not just kind of giving it as a neutral, unbiased, just, hey, here's what they believe. This was an article trying to convince you how wrong it is. So here's how it starts out. Replacement theology, also known as supersessionism, essentially teaches that the church has replaced Israel in God's plan. Adherents of replacement theology believe the Jews are no longer God's chosen people, and God does not have specific future plans for the nation of Israel. Now, I'll say this. They're definitely not God's chosen people. Because the Bible says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. If you're not justified, you're not the elect. You're not God's chosen people because we're elect by grace. It's election by grace, not election by race. The Bible says, even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. The Bible says, Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. If Israel and the elect are the same group, then how could God say, Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded? I mean, come on, folks. It's pretty clear that there's Israel and there's the election. Israel didn't get there. The election did. Not the same group. What does election mean? Chosen. Elect means chosen. Elect comes from the same root as the word select. You drop the S off select and you have elect. If we elect a president, we select a president. We choose a president or they choose for us. You know, that's another topic. So, yes, we do believe that the Jews are no longer God's chosen people. They're not. Look, you don't have to read very far in the New Testament to get this doctrine. You start out reading in Matthew 1, and as long as you can make it through that genealogy, and then, get, and then you read the Christmas story, the next thing is John the Baptist preaching, right? Chapter 3. And what does he say? Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the tree. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Did it sound like John the Baptist believed that Christ rejecting Israel, unbelieving Israel, unregenerate Israel? Did it sound like he believed, well, but they're still Abraham's children, so, you know, you still got to bless them. They're still special. God's not done with them. You know, last time I checked, when you chop something down and throw it in the fire, you're done with it. I mean, how many of you chop things up, throw them in the fire, and be like, oh, wait, I'm not done with that? Now, you might do that if you're careless or foolish, but that's not how God is. When God chops something up and throws it in the fire, he's done with it. God's still not done with the Jews, brother. You're right. He's not done kicking their backsides. He's not done punishing them. Because he says here in this article, you know, that God does not have a specific future plan for the nation of Israel. That's not where replacement theology teaches. Replacement theology teaches that there's definitely a plan for Israel, a specific plan to basically punish them, destroy them, wipe them out. I mean, yeah, he's got a plan, amen? God's not done with Israel, brother. He's not done kicking their backside. That's the true story, my friend. But what they mean is, we don't believe that God is using Israel as his servants at this time, and that he's not going to use those bunch of Polish people in the Middle East as his servants in the future either, because they hate the Lord Jesus Christ, they reject him, they're not saved, they're going to go to hell when they die, and they are not just going to en masse convert to Christianity. It's not going to happen. It will not happen. I can promise you that. I can guarantee you that because the Bible says it's not going to happen and I'll prove that to you from the Bible. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me keep reading their article here. Among the different views of the, the relationship between the church and Israel 
are that the church has replaced Israel, parenthesis, replacement theology. Amen. Or that the church is an expansion of Israel, covenant theology. And, and you know, I'm okay with that too. Because here's, here's what covenant theology would say. Covenant theology would say, basically, that, you know, Israel is the olive tree, right? And that basically the unbelieving branches are broken off and that the believing Gentile branches are grafted in. So, you know, they'll say like, well, it's not that necessarily, you know, Israel has replaced, been replaced by Christians in the New Testament, but it's just that people got removed from Israel and people got added to Israel. And look, I, I believe both because you know what? Those are just two ways of saying the same thing. They're both biblical illustrations of what happened. Because any way you want to look at it, you can look at it as, hey, it's no longer the Jews, it's Christians. Or you can look at it as, well, every single unbelieving Jew got removed. The Jews who believed in Christ got to stay in. And then Gentiles who believed in Christ got added. At the end of the day, you still end up with a tree that's made up of only people who believe in Christ. Right? Either way, you end up at the same destination. It's two different ways of getting there, but you're still getting to the same destination. And both routes are biblical because the Bible uses both parables. The Bible does explain it that way in Romans chapter 11. Whereas in other places, he just simply says, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Sounds like replacement to me. So either, uh, both of those are biblical because they both are just two different ways of saying the same thing. Either way, what you're saying is that the nation of Israel, the physical nation of Israel, isn't the chosen people anymore. Now it's a spiritual nation made up of all believers, whether they be Jew or Gentile, it's not relevant. Okay. So the three views that they put forth in this article, and again, this is a, a hostile article. It says, you know, replacement theology, covenant theology, also good, or that the church is completely different and distinct from Israel, parentheses, dispensationalism slash premillennialism. Now, here's what's funny about that. I'm premillennial. Amen? I believe Jesus Christ is going to return before the millennium. Premillennialism. So what they're trying to do is trying to attach this garbage doctrine of dispensationalism to a good doctrine of premillennialism and act like, oh yeah, these are the same thing. No, they're not, my friend. Premillennialism is something the Bible actually teaches. Dispensationalism is total garbage, okay? Now, listen, they're claiming that dispensationalism teaches that the church is completely different and distinct from Israel. Let me ask you something. Is that what Ephesians 2 just taught you? Is that what you got from Ephesians 2? This is what Ephesians 2 could have said. Church at Ephesus, you were once Gentiles according to the flesh, and guess what? You still are. You're spiritually Israel, but there's this other physical Israel that you have nothing to do with, and it's really cool, and they get a lot of blessings, and you don't, and they're better, and you're not them. Is that what it says? <laughs> Folks, it, it, just, it just clearly says, you know what? You're Israel now. The blood of Christ has made you nigh. And it even brings up the flesh lest someone try to twist this and say, well, it's just a spiritual. You know, lest someone try to allegorize this. No, you're, we're Israel. The only Israel that matters is the one that's actually made up of born-again, blood-washed saints. What makes the nation of Israel over in the Middle East God's chosen people? Can somebody explain that to me? What makes them that? Well, they're descended from Abraham. So is everybody else because we're so mixed. We've been on this planet for thousands of years mixing. We're all mixed. And you know what? The Jews, when they left Palestine, they were brown. And when they came back, they were white. So how does that work? You know, the Jews, so-called over in Israel, are a bunch of Polish people, Russian people, German people, Hungarian people, whose ancestors converted to Judaism hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago because they didn't love the Lord Jesus Christ. So instead, they converted to a Christ-rejecting religion. So basically, according to the old IFB, this is what makes you Jewish, following a Christ-rejecting religion. 
No, no, it's because they're ethnically Jewish. What does that even mean? Can you show me a genealogy, please? Because I would like to see the genealogy on these so-called Jews. Oh, yeah, they don't have one. And, oh, yeah, if they did have one, I wouldn't want to see it anyway because the Bible says to avoid genealogies. So, therefore, we don't have a genealogy to show that these people are actually even Israelites or Jewish, whatever that means. I mean, for all we know, the Palestinians probably have more of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's DNA in them than the Jews do because at least they didn't go live in Europe for thousands of years and, and intermarry with white people. I mean, come on. Does, 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 does everybody actually believe this garbage that Jews aren't white? Like, hello, is anybody help? Let, let's talk about some Jews that we know of that are famous Jews. Captain Kirk on Star Trek. Spock, okay, Jerry Seinfeld, Jeff Goldblum, Richard Dreyfus, Steven Spielberg, right? These are all, you know, Hollywood Jews that we're familiar with. Hey, how about this one? David Lee Roth. He's the chosen. He's blessed with faithful Abraham. You know, I'm bringing up a bunch of people that you would never know that they're Jewish if you didn't look at their name or have someone tell you because they look just like every other white European, okay? And, you know, uh, I was on a flight from Phoenix to New York, and it, there were just tons of Jews on the plane. And, I mean, they had red hair, freckles, blonde hair, blue eyes. They just, they're just white people, my friend. They're white. You're a racist against Jews. Well, I'm a racist against myself because we're all, you know, I'm white, they're white. How are we a different race? It's not, a di there's no difference in race, there's a difference in grace. That's the difference. I mean, what separates me today from a white person living over in Israel who's dressed like a 19th century Polish nobleman? Because let me explain something to you. That, that outfit that they wear, the white and the black and the hat and all that, that wasn't around in ancient Israel. That is the style of a Polish nobleman from the 19th century. There's nothing in the Torah that tells you to dress like a Polish nobleman. It just isn't there. So if, if you put me next to that guy that's a Polish nobleman, costume guy, white as snow, what is the colossal difference between me and him? Is it just that he has a little more... Abrahamic blood in him than I do? Maybe, sort of, I don't know. I don't have a genealogy, but maybe, kind of, sort of. I hope so. What, you you want to know the colossal difference between me and him? Is that I believe in Jesus and he doesn't. So let me ask you something. Which one's, who's better? The guy who believes in Jesus or the guy who doesn't believe in Jesus? This is not a trick question. Unless you're old IFB. So, so according to the old IFB, I guess I could become more blessed. I guess if I denounced the Lord Jesus Christ and got baptized into Judaism, which they actually do baptize you into Judaism, if I renounced Christ, converted to Judaism, dressed up like a Polish nobleman from the 19th century and started praying and wearing a funny hat, then according to them, now all of a sudden it's like, well, now you're the chosen people. Now you're blessed. And then if I got saved, it would be like a hundred times as cool as if a normal person got saved. Folks, this is the stupidest, most unbiblical trash that has ever masqueraded as Bible doctrine. It's absurd. It's ridiculous. Who told you that those people over there are Israel, huh? Did God tell you that in the Bible? Or did the media tell you that? Did the United Nations tell you that? Or did they just like self-identify? You know, everybody makes fun of these, you know, well, I identify as male. I identify as female. You know, or that guy who got 18 plastic surgeries and then identified as Korean. He tried to make himself look Korean, you know. You know, maybe, maybe you're born with it, you know, or maybe it's Maybelline. You know, but uh, you, you're, you, you know, it's like for a great sum, he tried to look Korean. You were, you were Korean born. I mean, what a blessing. But, but here's the thing, you know, oh, identify, you know, you know what? So a, a white Polish person just says like, well, I identify as Jewish. 
I mean, I want in on that, his blood be on us and on our children. That they screamed at the cross when they said crucify him. Folks, that makes you special? Folks, there's nothing cool about rejecting Jesus. And you know, last time I checked, the word of God said in the New Testament, if any man love not our Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Isn't that what the Bible says? You know what anathema means? Accursed. Okay? It says, if any man love not our Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Is that true or not? You believe that or not? Is that the word of God or not? Is that inspired scripture or not? If any man love not our Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. How about this one? If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. What is the doctrine? What is the doctrine that if, if they don't bring it to your house, don't bid them, don't, don't receive him into your house, don't bid them Godspeed. If you bid them Godspeed, you're a partaker of their evil deeds. What's the doctrine? Well, I'll tell you what it is because I've got it. I'm turned to it. Second John. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Okay, now let me ask you this. Do the Jews confess that Jesus Christ, Jesus, the Messiah, right? Yeshua HaMashiach. Do they believe that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, has come in the flesh? Do they believe that or not? So what does that make them, according to the Bible? Antichrist. A couple pages to the left in the Bible, 1 John chapter 2 says this. Who is a liar, 1 John 2, 22, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? Now somebody tell me what the word Christ means. Messiah. We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So what does the Bible say Christ means? Messiah. Okay. So then couldn't we also read this as, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Messiah? Wouldn't that be the identical meaning? Who is a liar but he that believeth that, that or, 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 or who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, you could also read this as, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Messiah? Do the Jews deny that Jesus is the Messiah? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Does that apply to the Jews or not? So are you telling me that the Antichrist is God's chosen people? Because that is what the old IFB is teaching right now. They're teaching that the Antichrist is God's chosen people. Because, an, look, in order to believe that Jesus is not the Messiah, in order to deny that Jesus is not the Messiah, you have to believe two things. You have to believe that there is a Messiah and that it's not Jesus. You can't deny that Jesus is the Messiah if you don't even believe that there is a Messiah. They're not denying that there's a Messiah. They're denying that Jesus is the Messiah. And that is the spirit of Antichrist that you have heard that it should come into the world. And the Bible says, even now already is it in the world. It's already here. The spirit of Antichrist is alive and well right now. According to scripture, it is the spirit that denies that Jesus is the Messiah. Why? Because think about who is the Antichrist? Isn't it a fake Christ or a fake Messiah or a false imposter? Okay, well then, wouldn't the spirit of Antichrist be waiting for some other guy that's not Jesus? Because you don't believe Jesus is the guy and you're waiting for some other guy. Of course that's the spirit of Antichrist. I mean, it's so simple. Even a theologian can understand. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Very clear, very simple, easy to understand. Back to this article here. It says, replacement theology teaches that the church is the replacement for Israel and that the many promises made to Israel in the Bible are fulfilled in the Christian church, not in Israel. The prophecies in Scripture concerning the blessing and restoration of Israel to the promised land are spiritualized or allegorized into promises of God's blessing 
for the church. So they want to make a big deal about God's promises and prophecies concerning the blessing and restoration of Israel to the promised land. Let me explain this to you very briefly because this is also very simple. When you look at prophecies or promises about the restoration of Israel to the promised land and their future blessedness, those scriptures fall into two categories. Number one, they're often talking about events that already happened. You know, a lot of these people, they don't read the Bible in context to realize that Jeremiah is a prophet right before the children of Israel go into the Babylonian captivity. And the book of Jeremiah records them going into captive in Babylon. So Jeremiah talks a lot about what? Them coming back. So Jeremiah talks about how after 70 years, they are going to return. And Daniel read the book of Jeremiah and Daniel read it and calculated it and did the math and realized when the 70 years were coming to an end and he started praying and making intercession to God because he knew that it was getting time for Israel to come back. So a lot of the scriptures that Zionists and people who teach dispensationalism will use is they'll take scriptures about God bringing them back after the Babylonian captivity and try to say that that's going to happen in the future. Same thing with Ezekiel. When's Ezekiel prophesying? Ezekiel's prophesying during the Babylonian captivity and he's preaching about the valley of the dry bones and he's talking about them coming back to Israel and the nation being revived and started up again and that already happened in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. So, well, you're saying God's not going to fulfill these promises? He already did. It already happened. Okay. But there are a lot of prophecies that also have future ramifications. And even the ones that already happened, they also foreshadow events that are coming in the future because I get it. Most prophecy has a dual fulfillment. And then there are a lot of scriptures that are only about the future. But let me explain something to you about these scriptures. If you actually look at them in context, they're all referring to a time after the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection. Now, let me explain to you what I mean. Jesus Christ told his disciples, he said, in the regeneration that the 12 apostles would sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So in the regeneration, the 12 apostles are going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. What's the regeneration? What does it mean to regenerate? It's talking about a, a, a coming back to life or rebirth or resurrection. And so here's what's going to happen in the end times. You know, I'm not going to go into all the details for sake of time, but obviously we know that all the gnarly stuff in the book of Revelation is going to play out, all the seals and trumpets and vials. And we know that that all culminates with the Lord Jesus Christ setting up his kingdom on this earth. And the saints are going to rule and reign with Christ a thousand years. There's going to be a millennial kingdom on this earth. Okay, before that millennial kingdom, you've got all the gnarly stuff in Revelation, which involves what? It involves the Antichrist ruling and reigning. But then he gets defeated and destroyed. Jesus defeats him in Revelation 19. And Jesus sets up his kingdom. And Jesus sits upon the throne of David. And he rules and reigns from Jerusalem. Amen? Everybody following? Okay. So let me ask you this. When the rapture takes place, the dead in Christ rise first, amen? And then we which are alive and remain are caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, what about the Old Testament saints? Are they dead in Christ too? I mean, look, nobody's saved without Christ. Nobody's going to heaven without Christ. Old Testament, New Testament, you're saved through Christ or you're not saved. It's, only one, it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Only the blood of Christ can save you. Old Testament saints look forward to the cross. We look backward to the cross. But everybody looked to Christ as Savior. You know, they didn't know his name. They saw through a glass darkly. We know the details. But the bottom line is, whether they knew the details or not, they were saved by Jesus dying on the cross because there's no other way to heaven. Jesus had to die for your sins or you can't go to heaven, period, right? So here's the thing. When the resurrection takes place, 
it's not just going to be New Testament saints in that resurrection. It's going to be Old Testament saints, too, that are resurrected. You know, look, if you would, at uh, Daniel chapter 12. Flip over to Daniel chapter 12. I mean, it's not like he just leaves the Old Testament saints hanging. Like he's just, re he's just resurrecting all the New Testament saints and the Old Testament saints are just like, dude, you know, they get resurrected too. Let's look at, let's look at this in Daniel chapter 12. It says, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as was not since there was a nation, even to that same time. And I mean, you know, that's obviously the same language used about the tribulation by Jesus in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even at that time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered Every one that shall be found written in that book, in the book, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, now jump down, if you would, to verse 9. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel. For the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thou thy way till the end be. Pay attention. Go thou thy way till the end be. For thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Now, a lot or a portion or an inheritance is what we're talking about. That's what the word lot means. Lot, portion, inheritance. He says, you will rest. What is it referring to when he says like, oh man, this is way in the future. Seal this up. It's way in the future. All these things are going to happen. Thousand days here, thousand days there. You know, we're not getting into the details of that in the scope of this sermon. But he says, go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest. What does it mean when it says thou shalt rest? You're going to, you're going to die. Obviously, it's talking about, because, you know, he, what did he say earlier? Those that sleep in the dust of the earth. He's talking about people who've died. And some of them are going to rise with a good resurrection. Some are going to rise for a damnation resurrection, right? But, but either way, he's saying like, Go your way, Daniel. You're going to rest, Daniel. He's saying you're going to be dead and laying in the grave, sleeping in the dust of the earth. But thou shalt stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Now, whatever you believe about the details of, you know, the 1290 days and the 1335 days and whatever you even believe about the sequence of the tribulation and the rapture, the bottom line is that when the time when that stuff is happening is when Daniel's going to be resurrected. He's going to rest until those days, right? Without getting specific about any kind of a chronology. It's pretty obvious that Daniel died and was buried. His soul went to heaven, of course. But his body is laying in the earth right now. I mean, has Daniel already been resurrected? Does anybody, I mean, I mean, think about it. Has Daniel already been resurrected? No. He's still there, right? You know, Peter, he got up on the day of Pentecost and he preached and he said, you know, David is, his sepulchre is with us unto this day. David's buried. David is not ascended into the heavens. So when Peter was preaching that, had David yet been resurrected? No, I mean, he said David's in his grave right now. David's in the tomb right now. That's what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. And we know Daniel is also still in his tomb. And the Bible talked about a false doctrine in the New Testament people that were deceivers saying that the resurrection had passed already. That was a false doctrine that Paul was calling out. So the resurrection hasn't happened yet. Daniel hasn't been resurrected. David hasn't been resurrected. But let me ask you this. When Christ returns and the trumpet sounds and we get resurrected as New Testament saints and those who are alive and remain are caught up together to meet him with the clouds, what about guys like David and Daniel and Abraham and Isaac? Are they getting resurrected too? Of course they are. 
All the saved are getting resurrected. Okay, so think about this now. If the saints are going to be resurrected and we're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years, what are the apostles going to be doing during that time? The apostles are going to, and I'm repeating this because I really want you to understand this. The apostles are going to be sitting on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what the Bible says. Now, are there 12 tribes over there uh, in Israel right now? Anybody know what tribe they are over there? Nope. Where's Reuben? Where's Gad? Where's Asher? Where's Issachar? Where's Zebulun? They don't exist. But let me ask you this. Do you think that there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, yay, millions of people from ancient Israel who were saved and who are going to be resurrected someday. I mean, throughout the whole, you know, thousands of years of the, you know, the, the, the couple thousand years of the nation of Israel's existence, right? About approximately 2,000 year existence until they're wiped out in 70 AD. You know, that nation existed for about 2,000 years. I mean, a lot of people are born and die in 2,000 years and they're, you know, they're worshiping the Lord. Obviously, a lot of them were unsaved. A lot of them are saved. But you got millions of and millions of people that are saved during that time. Were there saved people of Issachar? Saved people of Reuben? Saved people of Gad? Saved people from Asher? Absolutely. Are those people getting resurrected someday? Yes. And who's going to rule over them? The 12 apostles. So if, if people are like, you know, you guys, you replacement theology guys, you know, you don't believe that the promises God made to Israel are going to be literally fulfilled. Okay, well, let's talk about some of those promises. So when God promises that they're going to have this wonderful kingdom and David, their king, is going to rule over them and there's going to be peace and there's going to be prosperity and they're going to rule all the way from the river to the sea and it's going to be great, it's going to be one... I believe all that's going to happen, literally. Amen? It's going to happen in the resurrection. It's going to happen with a resurrected Issachar, resurrected Zebulun, resurrected Israelites living in the promised land. So is it going to be an Israel full of Israelites in the millennium? Yes. Is Israel going to be filled with 12 tribes of Israel? Yes. Are they going to have David, their king, ruling over them? Yes. Is it going to be a future restoration of Israel? Yes. But is it a restoration of those people that are over there right now that hate the Lord Jesus Christ? No, that's the difference. Now, if you would go to Galatians chapter 4. You see how they've perverted this doctrine. And, and here's what they'll say. They'll take the verse that says, and so all Israel shall be saved. And here's how they'll interpret that verse. They come, now, now look, you know what I'll do? I'll interpret it literally. They accuse me of spiritualizing things. Well, I'm just sorry. I'm just a spiritual guy. But here's the thing. Let me tell you how literally I take this. W you know, when I see 144,000 over in Revelation, it says 12,000 from each tribe. I believe that's literal. They don't. Because you know what they say? 144,000 Jews. Did the Bible say 144,000 Jews? Because I never read about 144,000 Jews. I didn't read that anywhere. That doesn't exist. Here's what I read. 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. 12 tribes don't exist, buddy. Those can only be resurrected from the Old Testament because they don't exist. Well, God knows who they are. So I guess he's just going to grab people that are white, black, Chinese, and, you know, you have a drop of Asher blood in you. We all do by now. 4,000 years later, give me a break. You know nothing about genetics if you don't understand the fact that 4,000 years later, we've all mixed and mixed and mixed and mixed and mixed many times. But it's like, well, God knows who they are. Okay, so basically you're, spirit, you're basically taking this loose interpretation. Well, you know, you're kind of an Asher kind of a guy back there somewhere in your family tree. I believe they're actual real Asherites, like a real tribe of Gad, a real tribe of Manasseh. And I believe that when it says the 12 apostles are going to rule over the 12 tribes of Israel, that it's going to be literally the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. Where did I have you turn? Galatians 4. So basically, you know, the, the thing is, to take this literally and say 
There's going to be a restoration of his... Oh, I'm sorry. I knew where... I, sorry, I lost my train of thought. But all Israel shall be saved is what we need to be talking about. Okay. All Israel shall be saved. I take it literally. Now, here's what they think it means. They think it means all of the unsaved Christ rejectors over there right now, when Jesus returns, they're all going to have a change of heart and get saved. That's what they think it means. All Israel shall be saved. At the second coming of Christ, they're going to see Christ coming in the clouds. and They're going to be like, what have we done? Oh my, we've made a terrible mistake. This, is our, this was our Messiah all along. We're so sorry. Oh, please forgive us. And oh, we're saved now. And oh, it's great. That's what they think is going to happen. Now, here's my interpretation of that verse. All Israel shall be saved because God killed everybody else and resurrected all the saved and saved people that are alive and resurrected saved people and everybody else is dead. Okay? <laughs> I mean, think about it. He says, hey, all Israel shall be saved. Now look, let me ask you this. During the millennium, is all Israel going to be saved? Yeah, because he wiped out the old bogus nation, the imposter, and now it's the real Israel, the true Israel, the saved Israel, because the other people are dead. Now, I don't, obviously, I don't believe all unsaved people will be killed in the end times. There's going to be a lot of unsaved people who survive into the millennium, but not the nation of Israel. It's not going to survive into the millennium. It's going to be wiped out. It's going to be wiped out to make room for the real Israel, God's chosen people, the saved Christians, who include Old Testament saints, Old Testament Israelites. So it's a literal fulfillment. It's a literal fulfillment of say, all Israel shall be saved. Amen. It doesn't say all Israel shall get saved. It says all Israel shall be saved. Be saved. Why? Because it's going to be an Israel composed of resurrected saints from the Old Testament nation of Israel, ruling and reigning with Christ and the New Testament saints, and we're all going to be ruling and reigning. Now, let me prove this to you. Look, look down at your Bible in Galatians chapter 4, verse 21, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. Now don't miss this. The old covenant, Mount Sinai, is represented by Hagar. And it's so funny because the old IFB, they're like, oh, you know, the Arabs, that's Ishmael. Nope, the Jews are Ishmael. <laughs> what does the Bible say? Who does the Bible say is Ishmael, my friend? You know, you know who Hagar is, right? Hagar is Ishmael's mom. Okay, so who is Ishmael according to Scripture? It's not the Arabs. Yeah, but I mean, they descend from... Who cares? Why are you so obsessed with ancestry when the Bible said avoid genealogy? Who cares? I don't care about your ethnicity or your ancestry. Do you care about mine? Who cares? You're carnal. Why would you even think about that? Why do you even care? Folks, Hagar equals Old Covenant. That's what the Bible says, okay? Let's keep reading. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. So who is represented by Jerusalem? Hagar is Jerusalem. Is that what the Bible says? Well, Hagar, that must be Mecca. Hagar's got to be Medina. No, Hagar is Jerusalem according to the Bible. If you actually want to believe the Bible and not Fox News, Hagar equals Jerusalem that now is and is in bondage with her children. So who are the children of Hagar? The children of Jerusalem. Today's Jerusalem. Today's so-called Jews, they're Hagar. Why? Because they're trying to be a part of what? The Old Covenant, Mount Sinai. What does the Old Covenant represent? Hagar! Well, they're under the Old Covenant. Oh, sir, so Hagar. 
well, you know, we're in the new covenant, but we don't believe in that replacement theology where the new covenant replaced, you know, it's the new covenant and the old covenant. They're the old, oh, so they're Hagar. Look what he says in verse 20. Or I'm sorry, verse 21. Tell me ye the desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? Oh, okay, so you want to have the two covenants going. You want to have the dual covenant theology because you don't like replacement theology. Okay, well, then why don't we go with that? Okay, Hagar. They're Hagar. Jews are Hagar. Jerusalem's Hagar. Old covenant equals Hagar. Judaism equals Hagar. That's what the Bible says. Let's keep reading. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. That's our, where our citizenship is as Christians, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren, thou that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Okay, is Jerusalem that now is Isaac? No, it's Ishmael, it's Hagar. We're Isaac. New Jerusalem. Isaac. Saved, right? Christian. But as then, he that was born after the flesh, Ishmael, persecuted him that was born after the spirit, Isaac, even so it is now. Remember when Ishmael was messing with Isaac and making fun of Isaac, what did Sarah say? Well, we're about to read it. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman is, is, is being set aside temporarily. Is that what it says? The, 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 the son of the bondwoman is temporarily being set aside, being put on the shelf, while God has this little interlude, this little blip called the church age, and then he's going to go back to dealing with Ishmael. He's going to go back to Ishmael being his special chosen one. Is that what the Bible says? Here's what the Bible says. It says, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we're not the children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Now, don't miss this. The children of the bondwoman will not inherit with the, with the children of the free. So let me ask you this. Is the millennium going to be a time when Christians and Jews inherit the land together? Or are just Christians going to inherit it? Think about it. Is it both? Is it this hybrid kingdom? Like, hey, it's going to be Hagar, and it's going to be Isaac, and it's going to be one big happy family. Ishmael and Isaac, and we're both going to inherit together because all of the Hagar people over there, they're all going to get saved. They're all going to have a change of heart, and then they're going to come in, and we're going to come in, and it's like the, we're getting the band back together. Is that what's going to happen in the end? It's not what the Bible says is going to happen. The Bible says that those people over there, Jerusalem that now is, Jerusalem that now is, they are Hagar and they will not inherit with Isaac. Only Isaac inherits the promised land. And Isaac includes saved Israelites from the old covenant because they're in the new covenant now too because they're saved. They're covered by the blood of Jesus too. And so they're, they're part of it too, right? We inherit because we're saved. And the Jews receive nothing. They inherit nothing, okay? Because they are Ishmael. They are cast out. Now, 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 let me just stop and just give you a little common sense about why this is such a foolish doctrine that says in the end time all the Jews are going to get saved. This is theologically prog problematic for several reasons. Number one... Isn't salvation a personal choice? I mean, do you guys, who, who here believes in free will? That we, you know, that we decide whether or not to receive Christ, that God wants everyone to be saved, Jesus died for everybody, and it's extended to everybody, and that whosoever will may come, but that it's a personal choice. That's what I believe. And that's what these independent fundamental Baptists claim to believe, but they believe that magically, all of the Jews will get saved. How does that work? Don't they, all, don't, don't they have to make that choice individually? Well, you know, one-third of them are going to get saved. Or two-thirds of them are going to get saved. or You know, magically. 
I guess. It's magic, huh? Because isn't it funny that they're not getting saved right now? That's theological problem number one. Salvation's a personal choice. You can't just say that it's like, think about how many generations of Jews have gone to hell. So it's like Jews in the 1600s going to hell, 1700s going to hell, 1800s going to hell, 1900s going to hell, 2000s going. But if you just happen to be lucky enough to be in that final generation, you magically get saved. That's ridiculous. It's absurd. So theological problem number one is that salvation is a personal choice. Okay. Theological problem number two is that according to the Bible, we get saved as a result of hearing God's word. We're not saved by sight. We're saved by faith. Okay. And the Bible says, faith cometh by seeing. No, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What is it that causes people to get saved? They hear the word of God. They believe the word of God. They believe. What is the power of God into salvation? The gospel. No, 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 you don't understand. That's just Gentiles. Well, last time I checked, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So what is the power of God unto salvation for Jews? The gospel. What's the power of God and salvation for the Greeks? Also the gospel. So, riddle me this. If a Jew living in 2021 is given the gospel from the word of God and rejects it, you mean to tell me that he's going to get saved because he sees a sign in the sky? Is that what you expect me to believe? Because I'm going to have to... Just reject a lot of scripture that tells me that that's not what gets people saved. They're going to see Christ coming in the clouds and they're going to see and believe. You know what? That's what they wanted on the cross, didn't they? They said, Jesus, come down from the cross that we might see and believe. And you know what? Those people are in hell right now. Isn't that what they said? We want to see and believe. But you know what the Bible said? Faith is the evidence of things not seen. To sit there and say that they can reject Christ now. And you say, well, maybe they just haven't heard. Well, the Bible already covered that too. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the world and their words unto the ends of the earth. Hey, are you telling me that Jewish people don't know about Jesus? Hey, they read about Jesus every day when they read the Torah. Every time they go to the synagogue, they're reading about Jesus. They know who Jesus is and they've heard the word of God. They've heard the word of God. They've heard the word of God. I mean, they grew up with the word of God. They grew up with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Isn't that all the word of God? Word of God, come, word of God, word of God, word of God, word of God. But, but yet they don't believe. Why not? Because they don't want to believe. Word of God on Monday, word of God on Tuesday, word of God on Thursday, Word of God for a year, Word of God for five years, Word of God for 20 years, Word of God for 40 years, Word of God for 50 years, not believing, not believing, not believing, not believing, not believing, not believing, not believing. Oh, look up in the sky. Let's get saved now. One third of us. Two thirds of us. All of us. What kind of crackpot doctrine is this? So basically what you believe is that the gospel isn't powerful. It's just a bright light in the sky. Jesus in the clouds is powerful. You know, I think the word of God's more powerful. That's what I think. And, and all, here's the proof. The man who's burning in hell, of course he doesn't get it because that's why he's in hell. He's down in hell and here's what he says. Hey, send Lazarus to go tell my brother and not to come to this place. What does Abraham tell him? They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Amen. Nay, Father Abraham, if one were to come back from the dead, they will believe. He said, if they believe not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So guess what? If they won't believe 
the Romans road, if they won't believe Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if they won't believe Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, neither will they be persuaded the one appears in the sky and the sun and moon are darkened and the stars fall and everybody sees Christ coming in the clouds. You know what? You know what? People are going to be weeping and wailing when he comes, but you know what they're going to be saying? Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? They are not going to be getting saved en masse. It's not going to happen. I've read the book of Revelation many times, and, you know, I only found the word Jews twice in the whole book of Revelation. And both times is to say that they say they're Jews and they're not, and that they're the synagogue of Satan. It's the only two mentions of the word Jews in Revelation. Well, what about Israel? Yeah, it talks about the 144,000 which is from each of the 12 tribes, which don't currently exist, and stopped existing well over a 1,000 years ago. So we're talking about Old Testament saved saints that are resurrected and brought back. It's that simple. And so I hope that this is helpful to you tonight. Uh, I know a lot of this is probably review for a lot of you, but I guarantee you that there are people here that, that maybe aren't as familiar with this. And even those of you that are familiar with this, it's good to, to hear these things again and revisit these things because... I'm telling you, this is a doctrine that, that people will, will fight you on, even though it's so clear, it's so obvious that, and I mean, look, I'm only scratching this, so I could go all night. I could literally preach on this subject until the sun comes up and not turn to the same verse twice. I'm not kidding. You want to try it? My family's out of town. I could do this. <laughs> I mean, I could literally, you know, okay, if you need the bathroom, go use it, you know. I, I mean, look, I mean, we didn't even talk about Romans 2, 28 and 29. We didn't even do my all-time favorite, Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. You want to go verse by verse through Romans 9? That's a tour de force. We could go verse by verse through Romans 9. And why stop there? Let's do 10 and 11. Right? Let's do it. Right? In fact, turn to Matthew chapter 1. Let's party. Look, I'm telling you, my friend. This doctrine is so easy to prove. I just picked a few scriptures. We could have gone to completely different scriptures. We could be in the epistle to the Hebrews tonight. I mean, we can, we can go wherever. We can go to 1 Peter. Are you kidding? 1 Peter would be the best place to turn. No, actually, I'm sorry. Revelation. Oh, what? never mind. It's Romans. I mean, we could go anywhere. It's everywhere. You want to go to Colossians? What do you want to do? 1 Thessalonians? Let's do it. 1 Thessalonians 2 would be ideal for this doctrine. Actually, forget all that. Let's spend the whole night just in the Gospel of John. Just the Gospel of No, 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 I changed my mind. Matthew. All those parables. I mean, Matthew is the one who flat out said, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, given to a nation, bring forth. I mean, folks, it's like a kid in a candy store. It's everywhere. That's why this doctrine is so scary to them because once a person is exposed to this, they can't unsee it. Now it's on every page. Now every time they read Galatians, every time they're, it's just like, oh man, whoa. And the old IFB is shaking in their boots and they want to die on this hill and that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to die on this hill because they're wrong and they need to understand that they're wrong and just get it, move on, deal with it. Let's buy another word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. And Lord God, I'm so thankful tonight that I'm not some kind of a second-class, partial citizen waiting on my green card or something, Lord. Thank you so much that I am a full-fledged citizen and that I'm not second-class because of my race or ethnicity or background, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, that every single one of us, red, yellow, and black and white, are all fellow citizens, fellow heirs, children of Abraham, Lord, thank you so much that election is by grace and not by race. And Lord, I pray that you'd open the 